Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Ramadan Kiriyim. Uh, my name is Talin Amour. I'm going to cover the following topics for you today. Um, we're going to talk about the Thalamus, Beza Ganglia, and the Cerebellum. And um, I understand the post-midterm material can be kind of a little bit hard and challenging because I feel like the doctor rushes through them uh, because of the, like, there's no enough time to cover everything like with a lot of details. First, inshallah, I'm going to try my best to cover the most important thing. Um, there are some slides that I didn't include. And um, I think I think I included everything, rephrased, but in my own way. And um, there are certain things I think from the basal ganglia lecture that I did not include. Uh, you can just open the lecture and follow that. Plus, I touched upon the most high yield things and the most important things, okay? Um, so let's start. Okay, Hala, before we start, the most important thing is I want you guys to orient yourself. Now, where are we? So today we said we're going to discuss in thalamus. Hello. We're going to discuss the basal ganglia, which is made up of basically the uh, substantia niagara, the basically the the lentiform nucleus, um, and yeah, so basically it's made up from the putamen and the gulbus pallidus and um, the caudate nucleus. Okay, so this is what the thalamus and the basal ganglia are, and then we have uh, basically the um, Wait, what was the last? Okay, the cerebellum. Okay, cerebellum is not included here. The cerebellum comes usually down. Okay, that's so you know how basically we have the midbrain here and like the, the brain stem. So the cerebellum is kind of it, it kind of goes from like from down and it's a brain by itself. Hello. Uh, another important thing that is mentioned in the calendar structure is the internal capsule that you guys can see in here. Okay, why is it important? Because we're going to talk about its lesions. And when we talk about its lesions, we um, understand more what are the things that happen, okay, when, uh, let's say, a stroke or a lesion happens there. Hello? So I, this is just in, like, I'm just trying to know, like, orient you more to where we exactly are and we're going to talk about the mom. So let's start with the thalamus, okay? Now, the thalamus, Okay, the most important, the, like you can think of the thalamus as an airport, okay? But an airport for a specific, let's say, okay, Turkish Airlines, tamam? So you know how Turkish Airlines, if you travel from Riyadh to anywhere in the world through Turkish Airlines, it usually goes back into Turkey and it stays there. And then we have like a, like a, like a connecting flight from Turkey to the place that you want to go right but the thalamic creating nuclei is kind of the same thing it's like a like a transit that every single um like neuron in the body is going to eventually pass through us hello but basically um we have three main divisions we have the interior the median and the lateral now um like between me and you guys the most important one for like step one and like for your board exam is basically the uh, lateral group. The anterior and the medial group are not that important, but uh, Dr. Vladimir included it. But let's just go over it real fast. So the anterior and the medial group. What you have to know is that مثلاً, the anterior group, we have the anterior nucleus that makes it up. And the anterior nucleus is concerned with memory. That's the most important thing to know out of all of this. Like literally the anterior nucleus, just know that basically it is um, concerned with memory. And that's what matters. Hatta, if you see, because it's concerned with memory, its connections are with, with like basically parts of the uh, brain that are concerned with memory. So we have basically the hippocampus and basically the mammalian body and the frontal lobe. Okay. I don't know if you have to memorize these, Saraha, but I don't think they're that important. Just know that the anterior nucleus is concerned with memory. And because it's concerned with memory, it's going to be part of the limbic system. Hello? The limbic system is made up of the hippocampus, the mammalian body, and so on. And then it goes and relays into the frontal lobe. Okay? Now, this is the anterior nucleus. That's all you need to know about it. And then we're going to move on to the dorsal medial nucleus, or basically the medial group. And the dorsal medial group, you just have to know and know it's, it has to do with mood, 
emotion, memory, and arousal. Arousal as in waking up, okay? Um, mood, memory, emotions, they're pretty clear. So because they have to do with mood and emotions, uh, we have the amygdala involved, tamam? And basically, uh, because, come on, we know that the prefrontal cortex, I think you guys picked this in psychiatry, prefrontal cortex makes a lot of, like, it's responsible for our behavior. So, one of the connections, prefrontal uh, cortex, come on. And then we have the temporal lobe. Uh, I'm not sure so why we have the temporal lobe, like, because I keep a specific function for it. But, like, what I could relate to is an amygdala and prefrontal cortex, they have to do with our behavior and emotion. So that's why they are the, the things that we, like the, the neurons from there are going to like go and relay and the uh, dorsomedial nucleus before going basically to anywhere else. Hello? Um, and then after they relay there and the thalamus, let's say, integrates and uh, gives whatever order it needs, uh, it's gonna go back to the prefrontal cortex and the cingulate gyrus. Come on. So, the anterior nuclei important in memory because it's important in memory. It's part of the limbic system. The well, limbic system is usually made up of the hippocampus. So, the important connections in the hippocampus and uh, mammalian bodies, and then it goes into the anterior nucleus. Hadol hin and the things that relay into it, and then after it's basically uh, kind of integrates the information. It's gonna send an uh, like a reply low end the frontal lobe, specifically singulate uh, singulate gyrus. So, mom, dorsal medial nucleus it has to do with mood, emotions, memory, and arousal. So basically, um, the 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 things that are going to relay inside the dorsal medial are the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex, and the temporal lobe. All of these are gonna go into the uh, the dorsal medial group. And uh, basically, they're going to put all their information there. The dorsal media is going to try to figure out like uh, a response, and then it's going to send it back to the prefrontal cortex and the cingulate gyrus. So, well, this is pretty clear. It's easy. Moving on, then lateral side. Okay. Now, we said in the lateral is the most like high yield, the most important, because as one, uh, when I went through first aid trying to prepare for this, I couldn't find anything for the interior and the media. So I literally just stick to the to the like uh, Dr. Vladimir's uh, slide. But when I checked the the first aid, I found things for the lateral side because it's the most important one. So mom, and we're gonna go one by one over these. So in the in the lateral side, we have four different nuclei. So mom, we have the ventral posterior lateral. Okay, so we have one the ventral posterior lateral. We have the the ventral posterior median. Okay, and then we have the ventral anterior and the ventral lateral. Hadole basically three and four. So, tamam, all of these make up the lateral area. Tamam, the most important thing about this is to know and know all of the uh, ascending sensory information goes into this part of the thalamus, except for olfaction, because we know olfactory, like the olfactory bulb and olfaction, it's just close to the brain, so yeah, yeah, it's so close to the brain, just sends it to sends it uh, re, like information directly into the brain without caring about anyone else. But all the other ascending sensory information, they have to relay the thalamus. So, well, now let's go one by one over them. So, wait. Okay, okay. So, our head is the ventral anterior nucleus. Okay. The ventral anterior nucleus is just the most anterior one, okay? And it has to do with movement, motor movement, tamam? But specifically, what kind of motor movement, or not what kind, but more rather where, like where does this motor fibers come from? They usually come from the basal ganglia, tamam? So ventral anterior uh, nuclei of the lateral thalamus Basically, uh, it's uh, is responsible for the motor, um, like uh, motor information that comes from the basal ganglia. Okay, and I'm pretty sure we're gonna talk about this like later on in the basal ganglia. But uh, just know that that's all that matters. Okay, I really don't care about anything the doctor wrote. Khalas, just say ventral anterior uh, motor from the basal ganglia. That's it. So on. Then we go to the ventral lateral. Come on, it's motor, but it's from the cerebellum. And if you guys think of it, it kind of makes sense. And no, basically the basal ganglia comes before the cerebellum. Like if you go from like 
man fo- like from up to down okay <laughs> okay so if, so basically we have the brain and then we have the cerebellum so because we have the brain and the cerebellum so it just makes sense that basal ganglia comes before the cerebellum but the basal ganglia will go to the ventral uh, anterior nuclei and then information from the cerebellum is going to go relay from in the ventral lateral okay and um it's important to know and know when they do that, they cross the midline before going into the ventral lateral. So the information from the cerebellum, they're going to cross the, the midline, and then they're going to go relay in the ventral lateral. That's important because if we have any lesion in the ventral lateral, we can know that it's going to affect the contralateral side, not the ipsilateral. But so with Chufuhan, the ventral anterior, it's going to affect the ipsilateral side because it doesn't cross the midline. So what do we have to know? Ventral anterior. Um, basically, motor, uh, motor move, uh, like motor information from the basal ganglia does not cross the midline, so any lesion in it is going to be epilateral. But ventral lateral, it's basically motor information from the cerebellum, and it's going to cross the midline, so any lesion in it is going to affect the contralateral side. Hello, that's all we need to know now. Um, moving on, we have the ventral posterior lateral nucleus. Okay, I know it's a very long name and it sounds complicated, but it's not. Uh, the ventral, ventral posterior lateral nucleus is just um, basically all of your sensory information, all of it, like literally everything, your vibration, your pain, your pressure, proprioception, light touch, that comes from everywhere, from the body, okay? And like be careful when I say from the body, okay? Because that's important, Tama. So, Anything that comes from the body, like vibration, pain, pressure, proprioception, light touch, everything that comes from basically the spinal ceramic and the dorsal column or the medial laminiscus, all of these are going to cross the midline and then they're going to relay in ventral posterior lateral nucleus. So technically, it's the area where all the contralateral um, somatosensory signals relay in, okay? I think it's clear. That's all you need to know. Guys, I don't know if the doctor is expecting you to know BA312. Honestly, I don't think you have to, Saraha. It's too advanced. But if the doctor mentions that he needs you to know them, just memorize them. But Saraha, I don't know. I don't really think they're important. Like, high years wise. But if you can do it, then just do it. Come on. Again, guys, ventral anterior. Motor from basal ganglia, ventral lateral, contralateral, uh, ba- uh, contralateral um, motor relay f- uh, of the cerebellum. The ventral posterior lateral nucleus, it's just the somatosensory, everything that has to do with any kind of sensation in your contralateral side of the body, they go relay there. So, mom, specifically in the body. Mom, then, you know, why am I like, specifying a lot like body because in the ventral posterior medial nucleus we're going to have a relay of all of the sensation of the face okay they're going to relay there yani all the senses from the contralateral side of the face they're going to relay in the ventral posterior medial nucleus not only that but so on it has to do with taste because if you think of it all of the soma- okay when we think about our somatosensory uh, senses in our face Taste is one of them, okay? So it's basically the somatosensory, um, somatosensory uh, like uh, information or signals like pressure, vibration, proprioception, blah, blah, blah. And taste, all of these are going to cross the midline and they're going to relate in the ventral posterior medial nucleus before going to the somatosensory cortex. So, so VA, VL, ventral anterior, ventral lateral, they have to do with the motor motor function so they're going to eventually lay we said no basically the thalamus is just a like an airport it's just a transit so they're going to transit there and then they're going to go to their the motor okay the motor cortex vpl and uh, vpml okay they're going to go to the somatosensory okay and and for vpml we're going to have basically ba43 for taste come on is everything clear till now? This is literally all you need to know in the thalamus. I know it sounds like a lot of different uh, nuclei, but it's easy. Let's, we can go over them really fast. So again, anterior nucleus is for memory, okay? So because it's a, for memory, and uh, hippocampus, blah, 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 
uh, the all of these relay there, and then they go to the um, then they go to what was the then they go to the frontal lobe. Yeah. But then we have the media dorsal is for uh, emotions, mood, um, basically memory command and arousal. And because they're they're because it's all of these things, it's gonna get information from the amygdala. It's gonna get information from the uh, prefrontal cortex and the temporal lobe. And then it's going to send it back to the prefrontal cortex and the cingulate virus. Then, VA, VL, they're both motor. VA is for basal, uh, basal ganglia. VL is for cere cerebellum. VL, it basically crosses the midline. So any lesion there is going to cause contralateral motor uh, deficits. Uh, specifically, and now we're talking about cerebellum. So you can think of things that, um, like uh, signs that are in the cerebellum. Tamam. Uh, then we have basically VPL and VPML, both of them somatosensory. One is from the body, one is from the face. Both of them are contralateral, and both of them eventually relate in the somatosensory cortex. Come on. This is all you need to know about uh, the thalamus. Now we're going to go talk about the reticular nucleus. So the reticular nucleus is located between the, um, the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So you can see in here, this is the internal capsule, and this is the posterior, okay? And then we have in here the lateral dorsal nucleus. It's literally in the middle. And um, honestly, all of this sounds like nonsense to me, all, you know, to me. But I think the most important thing is to know and know this nucleus is important in sleep and wake cycles. The mom, and it's the most regulatory, it's the regulator of signals in the thalamus. So it's the gatekeeper. Hello? That's all you need to know. And you can know that it can release GABA since he, and he mentioned GABAergic neur neurons in here. Um, but that's all you need to know. Like reticular nucleus, it's the one, it's the gatekeeper of the thalamus. It has basically uh, GABA releasing neurons. And, um, it is, it's uh, it's uh, responsible or important in sleep and wake cycles. Okay. Uh, it receives afferents from the brainstem, reticular information, cerebral cortex, and sounds. So it, really, it receives from everywhere. And then it goes into, it releases, oh, so it releases inhibitory output to other thalamic nuclei. So it's kind of like the big boss, tamam? So basically it keeps everything in the thalamus under control, tamam? So basically let's say, uh, no, um, so it keeps everything on, like in the thalamus under control. So you can see how it, it receives stuff from the brainstem, it receives stuff from the cerebral cortex and from the thalamus itself. But it's going to receive all of these inputs. It's going to kind of like integrate them. After it integrates them, it's either going to basically inhibit certain areas on the thalamus because it's the gatekeeper, it's the boss of the thalamus, or it's going to like not inhibit. But so know it has GABA, it's going to usually inhibit this, the part of the thalamus or it's not going to inhibit it. Like it's not going to really do anything about it. Come on. And it's important in sleep wake cycles. That's all. So a reticular nucleus, big boss, releases GABA. It makes everything, uh, it makes sure everything in the thalamus is working properly because it gets a lot of um, different information from different parts of the high, the brainstem, the cerebellum, the thalamus itself. And then it's, all of these are going to be integrated and then it's going to basically inhibit another dynamic nuclear. I hope everything is clear up to now. It's easy, I feel like. Again, it's doing this right. Okay. Um, it's important to know, and basically in thalamic cortical neurons, so the neurons that go out of the thalamus, hello, into the cortex, uh, they can exist in two kinds of physiological states. So they're either in the tonic mode or in the burst mode. Tonic mode is basically the normal, okay? So it's, uh, it's a neuron that, so tonic mode is kind of like, like lame and it's the basic. So it's like any other neuron, tamam. So it, uh, it acts to, like if we have a signal, it depolarizes. And then if after it, the thing, and after the signal propagates, it's hyperpolarized and so on. But something that is like kind of unique to thalamocortical neurons is the burst mode. Come on. Now the burst mode is um, a state where all of the neurons are at an intrinsic ryth rhythmicity. So they're all rhythmic and they're usually at a hyperpolarized state. Okay. So in burst mode, which is specific to thalamocortical neurons, they are all like uh, basically rhythmistic. They have intrinsic rhythmicity and they're at a hyperpolarized state. Now, Basically, what helps them have the burst, okay, 
is a specific class of calcium channels, which are the T-type uh, of calcium channels. And these calcium channels are only found on the thalamo uh, cortical neurons. And these are what allows them to have the breast mode. So what happens is when we have a calcium channel, like when it's triggered, what uh, there's there's going to be a birth, uh, a rhythmic burst of action potential in the thalamo cortical neurons, resulting in burst mode. So, um, so in any burst mode, it's just like that we release a lot of new, like we release the relay, like you know how basically all of the um, let's say we have a lot of sensory input into the thalamus, and then it's going to like release an output into the cortex. Um, in the specific, like, basically, uh, area that correlates to the function. So what happens is, with burst mode, we have their all of the cells are hyperpolarized. Yeah, I mean, any single thing can cause them to like burst. Come on. So because they're hyperpolarized, we have something called T-type calcium channels. Those T-type calcium channels, when they're triggered, they're going to cause the cells to burst in a rhythmic matter. So all of the cells are going to literally like burst all of the the like let's say neurotransmitters and informations and everything to the cortex and um this this mode is usually um basically is the most active when we're asleep so when you're asleep all of the ceramic neurons are usually in burst mode so they don't like they don't have the normal tonic mode where like it's simple and like like everything is normal no they have a like they're in like burst mode so they're literally like like waiting for a signal and then they're just gonna burst the information all over. So, huh? so just know that the burst mode is during sleep. That's it. Then this is the um what is it called? This is the um like blood supply for the thalamus. You can guys know this like by yourself. So uh -huh. okay. Now we're gonna talk about paramedian thalamic infarction. So what is a paramedian thalamic infarction? It's usually, okay, an infarct means we have an embolus. Hello? And the embolus, or you have either an embolus or any an occlusion of the artery. So, um, so the embolus in paramedian thalamic infarction is in the artery of percheron or the medial branches of PCA. So, um, so artery of percheron, this is important. He put it in red, but important, okay. So is there an occlusion or we have an embolus in this specific artery, what happens? We're going to have bilateral medial ceramic infarction. What does bilateral medial ceramic infarction mean? We're going to have both parts of the medial thalamus, like deprived of oxygen. So they're going to have an infarct or they're going to kind of die. Okay. So this is going to cause basically delirium. It's kind of like, it's no, it's going to either cause the, the patient to be agitated or comatose. So they're going to either be in a state where they're like agitated and they're kind of like, I don't know, they're having delirium, they're thinking of things that are not true, or they're going to be comatose and they're not going to be responsive. Come on. Uh, they can come on have uh, hemiplegia or hemisensory loss, it depends. But the most important uh, nuclei that is usually like affected by this is the cranial nerve number three. So we're gonna have ophthalmoplegia. Come on. Uh, patients that have perimedian thalamic infarction, they're gonna basically take a lot of days to recover. Um, and um, alertness is gonna return, but they're not gonna have a good functional recovery. Why? Because they're gonna have severe memory dysfunction. So. Um, in summary, in paramedium thalamic infarction, we're going to have an uh, embolus or an occlusion of the artery of parturone, which is basically medial branches of PCA. We're going to have bilateral medium thalamic infarcts, and these are going to cause the patients to either be agitated in a, delir in a delirious state or a comatose. And they might have hemiplegia and hemisensory loss, but most importantly, the cranial nerve number three nucleus is going to be affected, resulting in a pharmaplegia. And um, other than that, you know, they can recover and they're going to like return, like their, their, their alertness is going to come back to normal. But um, they're going to have permanent memory uh, dysfunction. Okay. And that's why the prognosis usually is poor. Another um, kind of syndrome or like another like problem 
I don't know this order. Okay, is thalamic pain syndrome. And usually it's because of something called lacunar strokes. So lacunar strokes are very like really tiny strokes that happens in the thalamus, uh, specifically in the thalamic perforating branches of PCA. And they will affect the VP nucleus and the you know, VPL and VPM. And if you think of it, VPL and VPM, what do they supply? They supply the somatosensory, contralateral somatosensory. Um, like they have basically, that's what we lay in them, the, uh, the somatosensory uh, information of the body and the face and taste. So it makes sense and no, those people are gonna have all forms of somatic sensations in the body and the face. They're going to be lost contralaterally. Come on. And it makes sense all of these kinds of sensations, like pain, vibration, proprioception, light touch, fine touch, everything is going to be lost on the contralateral side. And uh, that's a pure hemisensory loss. Come on. Uh, basically, central pain usually occurs if it affects come on, the ALS and VPL. So these people are going to have like oh actually they're gonna have analgesia okay but then suddenly they're gonna have aching burning pain and excruciating pain they're just gonna have a lot of pain okay and this pain how do we know it's like thalamic pain syndrome basically this pain is gonna be like unresponsive to any kind of analgesia okay so I, if, uh, basically if als is central pain if als is affected in vpl okay then we're going to have halas. We're going to have the pain, which is basically aching, burning, and excruciating, and it's refractory to any medication. So, as it does, and now we have basically a lacunar stroke, usually in the thalamo performing plans, uh, perforating branches of PCA. It's going to affect the VPL, VPML. So, it's going to affect the somatosensory of the contralateral side. So let's say we have the, the the stroke in the left side. So the right side, somatic sensation is gone. Tamam? And if it affects ALS, we're going to have this excruciating pain. And it's not going to respond to any inflammatory. Tamam? Now we're going to talk about the metathalamus. Now metathalamus, I don't know why the doctor likes to, I mean, I don't know. Anyway, you know, metathalamus is just part of the thalamus. Okay, it's just like you can see those little tiny nuclei. Or I like attached to it. Okay, so we have two bodies: the lateral geniculate body and the medial geniculate. Hello. Now they're related to our senses, like sight and uh, hear. Okay. And uh, you see, you remember how in VPML we have basically both um, somatosensory and taste. But in come on, in our face, the red taste, we have basically our like our, our like vision and hearing, which are other somatosensory like sensations, okay? But those are not included in VPML because we have literally nuclei specifically for them. A lateral geniculate nucleus is related to sight. And this is usually related to sight. And you can think of like the L as light. So L, lateral, light, we see the light. So it has to do with our eyes. Now what happens is it usually on a visual relay, the this specifically body, and um everything that has to do with eyes, literally anything that has to do with the eyes is gonna go and relay in the uh, in the sorry in the lateral geniculate body. Like you can see, there we have photoreceptors, bipolar cells, ganglions. All of these are going to like go back into the optic tract. So kill optic tract is gonna go. And it's going to relay in the lat uh, lateral geniculate nuclei. And this is going to like, uh, like uh, basically try to understand uh, the, like integrate the information. And then it goes back into the optic radiation and sends it to the primary visual cortex. Come on. Hi, Tala. Hi, yeah. Uh, there is a question in the chat. It asks, what does the Kuhner stroke mean? Okay. Uh, so lacunar stroke is okay. So it's just a fancy name for a stroke. Come on, but we have specific um, branches. The lacunar stria. Okay, those are like a branches of the PCA. But a lacunar stroke is specifically just like literally, it's just a like it's just a fancy name for a stroke. Oh, it's usually why do they call it lacunar? Because of uh, basically. 
wait. You know, not a specific reason why is it called the corner stroke. It's just that, okay, when we say the corner stroke, we know that it involves the tiniest, teeniest blood vessels in a very like specific part of the brain. Come on. I hope I answered your question, Saraha. I'm checking like online if there's specifically something that explains yani, what lacuna is. But Anna, on like based on my like what I know, it's okay. It's basically occlusion of very tiny vessels. Okay. Because those tiny vessels are usually called lacunal striate vessels. But when a stroke happens in it or an occlusion or whatever happens inside it, this means a no. Uh, like it's just it just tells you specifically where the location is. Come on, I think it's clear. So before I move on, do you guys have any questions about anything I mentioned in the previous slides? Just so because we have a lot of like different information in this like specific uh, like mini presentation, but I don't want you to go to the next part without understanding the basics. But if you have any questions. Okay, I believe there is no question. Um, so, yeah. so again, we said lateral geniculate uh, nuclei, L for light, so it has to do with their eyes. So everything that has to do with the eyes is gonna relay there. So the optic tract is going to go re uh, relay in the later lateral geniculate nuclei, and then it's gonna basically send optic radiation back to the uh, primary visual cortex, so on. طيب هلا إذا نحنا عنا lesion in the lateral geniculate nuclei what do you guys expect will happen so it has to do with vision so we're gonna have visual def uh, deficit تمام so what happens is we're gonna have contralateral homonominous hemonopia without macular fairing what does this have what does this mean يعني it's just a very long name بس what it means is طيب هلا into in HNS you're gonna take this in more details but these are our eyes Okay, these are our eyes, and basically our vision in in the like. Okay, our vision. Let's say this is the eyes. Tamam. Later on, you're gonna take and know basically in the optic tract. Oh, but the whole thing. Yani, if there was um an injury to any part of it, it's gonna cause a visual like disturbance in a different way. it's the macula. Okay. So this is this is a point which is called the macula. Usually we have something called macular sparing in certain lesions. But how can it be without macular sparing? So the macula is not spared. Okay. And we have something called contralateral heminon uh, heminonymous hemianopia. Okay. Hemi means one side. Anopia means the vision is gone. Tamam? So we have contralateral hemianopia without macular sparing. So what does it mean? So let's say we have, um, let's say and the injury was to the left lateral geniculate body. So what happens is that the right eye, okay, or the right side is gonna be affected. We're gonna have يعني, the right side of the eye. So this, this is basically right, left, right. So the right side of the eye, it's going to be affected or they're going to be blind with the side. Like, it's not spared. So they're just going to not be able to see from this side. Why? Because we have a... Uh, so I'm basically it's usually in both eyes. Come on. So that's how their vision will be. They only can see like... I know it sounds crazy because that's the, the way it's uh, like manifests. But what happens is we're going to have contralateral. So if the thing happens in the left, it's gonna uh, act on the right. Homonominous hemianopia. So basically the whole, like, homonominous. Yeah, homonominous means both of them. So homonominous, both eyes are gonna have the right side of the eye completely gone without macular sparing. So hatta the macula here in the middle is not gonna be spared. Like, like macula is in the middle, but it's like on the left to right part of the macula, okay? I hope it's clear. You're going to take this in more details, like uh, in HNS. But yani, for now, just know and know a lesion in the lateral geniculate body is going to cause contralateral, hemianopia, 
without macular sparing. تمام? And I, and it just means that you know, the other side of the eye, literally the, the, the other side is just going to be, it's just going to go. تمام? Hala, going on, we have the medial geniculate body. For the medial geniculate body, M. So it starts with an M. M is for music. Okay? Music, we listen to music, so it's in the ears. Okay? So it has to do with hearing. But what happens is, and everything that has to do with hearing is going to go and relay in the medial geniculate body. So we have basically, you're going to take these specific details later on, but we have basically the cochlear nuclei. It's going to go to the trapezoid body, superior liver nucleus, lateral lemniscus, and pericolicus. I don't, I don't, I, I don't waste your time memorizing what goes specifically. Just know, for in here, optic tract goes to LGB. In here, inferior colliculus goes to MGB. That's it. And then it, go, it, it results in auditory radiation and it goes into the auditory cortex. Come on. Hello. Is anyhna? We have a stroke or something that affects the medial geniculate body. So the medial geniculate body is gone. What's going to happen is we're going to have bilateral partial hearing loss. So, and why do we have bilateral partial hearing loss? Because we have a left, we have a left. Um, MGB, okay, and we have a right MGB, tamam, and this is an ear, okay, and this is another ear, tamam, so the right MGB, okay, it's going to have a little bit of neurons here, little bit of neurons here, the left is going to have a little bit here, and a little bit here, so if one of them is gone, basically this is going to go, and this is going to go, so we're going to have bilateral, both sides are going to have partial hearing loss. Is this clear? I think it's clear. It's not hard to easy, guys. So left geniculate, light, visual uh, disturbances. If we have um, 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 like a stroke or a, an, something that's like affected, we're going to have contralateral hemianopia without macular staring. Uh, MG, uh, MGB or MG nucleus uh, or body, Basically, M for music, hearing. When we have it, we're going to have bilateral hearing loss, partial hearing loss, like not full hearing loss because only half of it is gone. So, well, this is everything about the metathalamus. And this is important. Like, guys, it's important. It's high yield. Um, they ask you about it in step one. But, Yanni, just kind of memorize the specifics of us, come on. In specifics, I mean, just like literally these, like the, 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 the problems that happen and that's it. And that it has to do with eyes or it has to do with ears and that's it. Come on. Like the things that basically go relay there, um, you're going to guys take them in a tennis. And I don't think they're that easy to ask you about them. Anyways, moving on, we have the epithalamus. Epithalamus is just literally the pineal body. You can see how tiny it is here. Um, it's just, it has to do with melatonin. Uh, and your circadian rhythm. So basically, it really is melatonin, and the melatonin makes sure that we have uh, um, like a, a circadian rhythm, so we're able to sleep at night. If we have a tumor there, we're gonna have something. Um, so basically, you can see how tiny it is, come on. So if we have a tumor there, it's gonna compress the midbrain. So the midbrain is right here. So it's gonna stop, they compress the midbrain, uh, and it's gonna re result in something called paranoid syndrome, come on. So if we have a pineal tumor, okay, it's going to compress the uh, superior colliculi of the midbrain, resulting in paranoid syndrome. Paranoid. I don't know how to spell this. this is, that's just paranoid or whatever it is, syndrome. And the pineal tumor, come on, it's going to compress the cerebral aqueduct because the cerebral aqueduct is somewhere here for the safe and non-communicating hydrocephalus because it's preventing it. Uh, basically, the fluids from moving on. Come on, oh, it's easy. Pineal body, circadian rhythm releases melatonin. If we have a tumor, it's gonna compress the it's gonna compress cerebral aqueduct from circa non communicating hydrocephalus, and it's gonna compress the paranoid. Uh, sorry, it's gonna compress the superior collicular of the pretextual area or the midbrain area, resulting in paranoid syndrome. That's all you need to know. Moving on, subthalamus. Okay. So it's in, the subthalamus has to do with the um, basal ganglia circuitry in D2. We're going to talk about this later on. So if we have any, like if the subthalamus is affected, we're going to have hemibellismus. Come on, we're going to talk about this in the basal ganglia lecture. 
Um, بس انه it's contralateral usually تمام؟ blood supply through مثلا perforating arteries you guys can memorize that but it's not that hard. Anyways, moving on we have the internal capsule. Okay. What is the internal capsule? The internal capsule it's a V-like shape تمام؟ it's literally here like wait. It's just I my bad. Okay, so you can see this this V in here at the internal capsule. Now, internal capsule, why is it important? Because literally, literally, all the projection fibers of every single neuron in your body literally relays there. It moves through that. Come on, I feel this very small V. All the neurons of your body relay there, okay? So that's why it's important. And, um, okay. And another important thing is, and no, um, we have basically parts. So this is the anterior part of the internal capsule. This is the genu, and this is the posterior part. Come on. And if we have basically, uh, so different kinds of neurons relay in different parts of the internal capsule. So if we have an injury or an infarct in a specific area, this is on a specific uh, manifestation. And we're going to talk about that. So an anterior limb, usually, what does it contain? It has the thalamocortical fibers from the dorsal medial and the anterior thalamic nuclei. Um, wait, I'm sorry. Yeah. So we have dorsal medial and why is it not writing? Oh. Okay, dorsal. Um, anyways, I don't know why is it doing this. Wait, maybe. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, so um, yeah. so basically, with anterior limb, we have the thalamocortical fibers to show about dorsal medial and anterior nuclei. Let's remember what do the dorsal medial and anterior nuclei do? They're concerned with memory, emotions, mood, um, arousal, all of these things. They go and relay in the frontal lobe. So, as a basic reaction, any Anything that affects the anterior limb, but we're gonna have like behavioral changes. We're gonna have um, memory is gone. Uh, we're gonna have uh, you get me. We're gonna have amnesia, yani. So this is the anterior limb. Hala al genu lihon. This really this. So oh, it's working. <laughs> so we're gonna have the corticobulbular tract. Come on, it's gonna move from there. And the corticobulbular tract. Okay, what does it have to do? It has to do with the muscles of the head. Mom? Okay. Mom, so the genu, it has to do with the muscles of the head. But if there's something affecting it here, the muscles of the head, okay, are going to be affected. And then lastly, the posterior limb, so it's important to know. Genu, corticobulbar uh, tract. Posterior limb, we're gonna have basically the corticospinal tract, okay? It's usually arranged in a way like honor genu, okay? We have here muscle neck, then we have basically the upper limbs, then the lower limbs, and so on. Come on, so it's basically a genu, kind of a descending, like from the neck, and you have things that have to do with the head, then neck, our arms, chest, until we reach the limbs. Come on, kind of subhanAllah interesting. Um, uh, then, um, yeah, so we're gonna have this is the first one corticospinal tract, and the other one is the thalamocortical fibers that comes from the VP nuclei. Again, the VP, the VP is basically for the somatosensory and it goes to the post uh, central garris of the parietal lobe. So we have in here not only corticospinal, not only movement, okay, come on, and no sensory. Come on. We're gonna talk about yeah the 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 legions of the high after we talk we finish from the re retro lentiform lentiform. Um guys again just memorize wallahi any this one has nothing to do just know that retro lentiform optic radiation so basically it goes into the LGB light that's it retro lentiform retro lentiform is for the optic radiation so it has to do with eyes so LGB that's it runs through it. The 
Subplantiform, it has to do with hearing or auditory radiation, but it comes from the MGB. Okay. 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 You see how in here we say that we have auditory radiation. Here we said we have uh, optic radiation. So this radiation is the is the basically the the parts. So the the basically the sub the sublentiform. Okay. It is the auditory radiation that goes up, out from the MGB. A retrolentiform is the optic radiation that goes out from the LGB. Come on. Come on. Now we the important thing, which is basically the um, strokes. These are questions that that are going to 100% come. They love, they love inter internal capsule strokes. Oh, we are knee and farts. Come on. But guys, keep these in mind, memorize them, specifically the blood supply to know where in the internal capsule we have the, um, like, attack. So, let's start. The first thing we have is You remember the genu? It's basically we V. The genu is here. And we said it has to do with the, it has corticobulbar, uh, it has to do with the corticobulbar, um, like nuclei. So what happens is anything that affects it is going to affect the corticobulbar, it's going to cause corticobulbar palsy. Okay? So what happens is, uh, the thing that supplies the genu is the anterior choroidal artery and the lenticulostriate branches of the middle cerebral artery. Guys, I feel how many feet? I don't know. I don't know. I don't are very tiny branches. Like, they're mighty and they're, they're so tiny. But basically, if these are affected, usually we have what we call the lacunar stroke because they're very tiny. Sefi, a lacunar stroke. So basically, lacunar stroke just means a very tiny stroke in a very tiny, like, in very tiny branches, okay? Because literally, guys, the lenticular stri are like, like, you know, okay, this is an artery. Lenticular stri are like, some things like this. Like, they're so tiny. Come on. Come on, let's uh, memorize the blood supply. So the anterior choroidal, and the lenticulostriate of the middle cerebral. So what supplies the genome? Anterior choroidal and the lenticulostriate of the middle cerebral. For those two, if they are affected, if we have a stroke in them, what are we gonna have? Corticobulbar palsy. So the so because it makes sense, any corticobulbar um like like things go through it. By kids, we're gonna have corticobulbar palsy. So how will it manifest? We're gonna have contralateral lower face weakness. Okay, we're gonna have deviation of the EVO towards the lesion. Come on, and we're gonna have deviation of the tongue away from the lesion. So again, if we face, let's say, I mean, let's say, okay, you see here, the patient has a lacunar stroke in his right side. So what would happen? His left, okay, his left side. So this is the right. Ah, okay, okay. So basically, this is the patient's right. We have a stroke in here. So what are we going to have? We're going to have face weakness. So you see how basically he's he's literally like grimacing, like he's moving his face. And here they can move, but they're not moving. Why? Because we have face weakness. So patient's right. On Hana, we have the, 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 the his left side of the face. So we're going to have facial weakness. He's not going to be able to move his face. Hello. Okay. This side is moving, Wadi, it's so on, but this side is not. So on. This is number one. Why? Because it has facial nerve. The facial nerve is affected. Come on. Hi, number one. Number two, we're gonna have deviation of the uvula toward the lesion. You know what the uvula is. So basically, let's say this is a mouth. This is the tongue, and this is the uvula. Now the uvula or uvula, or whatever it's called. It's gonna deviate toward the lesion. So if the lesion is at the right, it's gonna go heck out of the right. It's gonna like, whoa. Come on. Why is that? Because the right is just gonna ah, it's just it's gonna deviate towards the lesion. Hello? In tongue, it's gonna deviate away from the lesion. Come on, why the tongue will deviate away from the lesion? Because um basically this side is contracting and this side is relaxed. But if this side is contracting, it's going to push it towards the contracting side. When relax, it's just going to like fall off. It's just going to be flaccid, you know, like. Come on. So we have internal capsule legion to the genu, 
or if basically the question will say, um, a patient presented with a um with basically lower face weakness. Okay, the patient presented with left side lower face weakness. Uh, the uvula uh, goes toward the uh, right, and the tongue uh, goes uh, towards the left. Come on. What artery is affected? And then they're not going to tell you, oh, is this a, what's the, what's the part that's affected? And you're going to say, genu, no, they're going to ask about the artery. But you're going to be like, oh, it's the, it's the genu. So basically it's the anterior choroidal artery or the lenticular strike branches of the medial cerebral artery. Come on. Is it clear? I think it is. Come on. Um, So man, it's an upper motor neuron policy, and I think you guys know what an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron policy is. So please don't ask me because it's kind of like it's gonna take so much time to explain. But moving on, this is the genome. So moving on, we're gonna talk about the posterior lump again. What did we say in the posterior lump? What do we have in the posterior lump? We have um, basically. Let's go back here. In the posterior limb, you can see if MGB with LGB are in the posterior part. Other than that, we have basically the corticospinal tract. Okay? And, and the corticospinal tract. And, and we have the thalamical cortical fibers. So let's specifically talk about sen sensations. Oh, oh, what are the deficits going to be? They're going to be in the movement. So they're not going to be able to move. They're not going to be able to sense anything on that side. And because we have the LGB and the MGB affected because of the like sub form and retro form because they pass through the posterior. They're somewhere in here. But if the lesion happens here, they're going to be affected. Okay. So since they're affected, what happens is you're going to expect they're not going to be able to move. They're not going to have any sensation. And not only that, they're going to have uh, the hearing and the vision affected. And you actually see that here. So what happens is, uh, so what happens is, what happens is we have a lacunar stroke in the posterior, uh, basically limp of the, uh, sorry, <laughs> the posterior limp of LV, which is the internal capsule. capsule. So what happens, we're gonna have contralateral hemiplasia. Yeah, and half of the side of the body is not gonna is gonna not work anymore. They're gonna have muscle weakness, atrophy, everything. Like they're not gonna be able to move. They're gonna have contralateral anesthesia, so they're not gonna be able to sense anything on the same side. They who are basically same side as the hemiplegia. So contralateral. So let's say the right posterior limb is affected. It's gonna the deficits are gonna show on the left side. So we're gonna have left hemiplegia. Left, uh, left anesthesia, so they're not going to feel anything on that side. And not only that, but they're going to have basically command contralateral homonominous hemonopia. Remember what we said? They're going to have homonominous hemonopia with, uh, without macular sparing. So the right side is affected in the command and the left vision is gone. Like not the eye, the left half of the eye. So the left of this and the left of that is totally gone. And we're going to have slight bilateral uh, hearing loss. Come on. Okay. Is this clear? Before we go to the basal ganglia, those are very important slides. Like I can't stress how much. I, I, I don't remember my final, but I remember and we got a question about the internal capsule. Uh, please, Hafazu, how will they uh, like manifest? And uh, memorize the blood supply so you know what is affected. Okay. Um, Tala, Noha is asking yeah. what was passing through anterior limb. What was passing through the anterior? So the anterior limb, like, it's just the memory and the you remember the uh, the vent like the anterior and the medial groups of the thalami. So basically, like from them, that's what like that's what passes there. So it has to do with memory. It has to do with behavior. It has to do with um like okay let's go in here remember the actions of those two so everything that has to do with those two is what goes through the interior um basically the oh they're gonna any it will manifest as basically memory impairment they're not gonna 
I don't remember, I don't know specifically what's the kind of memory impairment that's going to happen, but I know that if you have memory impairment, as if you have behavioral changes, um, and that's all. That's everything that's going to also manifest. Because if you even look at where it, my bad, okay, where it goes and relays its information at the frontal lobe, we know another frontal lobe is uh, like one of its function is regulating mood and behavior and uh, emotions and so on. Come on, for. If we have a lesion to the anterior limb, it's gonna like like manifest as memory impairment, behavioral changes, and so on. That's why it's not mentioned in here because um it's not that high yield. That's all what you need to know. You just need to know the genuine and the uh, posterior limb. I know they're going to manifest as things that you see, okay? And then like the genu, we're gonna have basically Again, facial weak, contralateral facial weakness. We're going to have uvula where it's going to go to the same side, like deviate towards the side. The tongue is going to deviate away from the side. In posterior limb, we're going to have things on the body, hemiplegia, anesthesia. We're, we're going to have uh, bill eye with ears. Come on. I hope this is clear. This is everything for the thalamus. So we finished the thalamus. We're going to go over the basal ganglia. I just want to make sure and know you guys have everything like um like is everything clear up to now? Oh, why is my video not there? Anyways, is it clear, guys? You can send chats. I can see the chats now. Yeah, it is part of the limbic system, like the interior. We said also, I know it has to do. It's a part of the what was it called? The patas or whatever was it called? Um circus. Okay, so um shall I move on to the basal ganglia? Yeah, my next How can you tell apart like a uh, mid what do you call it? A uh, brainstem lesion from the uh, what do you call it? What lesion? The internal capsule? Yes, the anti uh, the posterior because both Hi. would have a uh, uvula and tongue deviation. So, mm -hmm. like, they're the opposite of each other, but here it could be, like, contralateral left and right, right? So, how can you tell them apart? Anything that comes from the brainstem is going to be a lower motor neuron pathway. Hello? So, you know how... Um, I don't know how to specifically explain it, because but I I'm going to be honest with you, I don't have enough information about what the lo lower motor neuron pathway is. Because I only covered what is in this lecture, but uh, I think the, the the main difference is you know in the genu when we affect the genu we're gonna have an upper motor neuron pathway. Okay, so um, try to just try to figure out what's the difference between an upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. If you want, I can do my research after the session and explain it to you specifically. I really don't mind. Uh, but honestly, now I have no idea what's the difference between them. But you no. Know, the, so all I know is an basal ganglia is going to have the lower motor neurons. So it's going to affect, you get me? It's not going to come, like the infarct is from the brainstem level, not from the brain. The brain has the upper motor neurons that goes and basically, um, like, real, so basically the nuclei of the um, upper motor neuron or the maiden cells, they, they pass through the genome. Come on. So basically, okay, wait, let me draw. So you can see it here, like the drawing in here. So this is the brain, and this is uh, the upper motor neurons. They're somewhere in the cortex. They're going to center cells, and uh, they're going to cell basically like neurons, and they're going to pass through the genome. And then they're going to go and relay in Masanan, the different parts of the brainstem, the pons, the medulla, et cetera, depending on where the, basically where the, uh, where the like uh, nuclei of a specific uh, cranial nerve is on the different parts of the midbrain. So if you think of it, if I'm affecting the pons, okay, I'm affecting the nuclei, so I'm affecting the lower motor neurons. So do you get me? Because every motor neuron has an upper, like we have two powers. We have the upper motor neuron and we have the lower motor neuron. Come on. But the upper power is from the cortex, and then the other power is from the nuclei of the thing itself. So the upper motor will act on the nuclei, and then the nuclei is going to send and act on the rest of the body. So if we have a brainstem lesion, it's going to affect the, 
basically lower motor neuron um basically the yeah the lower motor neuron um it's gonna affect the lower motor neuron and the upper motor neuron is paired i hope like i covered the idea of us if you get me yeah i think i get it yeah okay uh, any more questions before I move on? We're going to cover the basal ganglia. I know you guys are excited for basal ganglia. Because I'll take the silence as a move on. Come on. Okay. Basal ganglia. For the basal ganglia, uh, one second. My God, okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Can you see my face recording? No. No? Why is it like this? Because. <clears throat> hmm. Oh boy. If I, because I want you, because I've been like doing all of these like movements when I'm Bashra, and now I realize you guys can't even see me. <laughs> okay, can you see me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. So, and that means a good idea. So, it's important to, I'll tell you something, guys. Before that, I tried, I really, really tried to take Dr. Yaqeen's slide because I couldn't. Um, I included some of his slides, um, but I felt like it didn't work with me. I couldn't explain on them. But all of these slides I had are from BNB, okay? And I'm going to explain on them. Thus, they include everything in the lecture. I'm pretty sure and everything is covered, inshallah. Um, except, um, no, the, I'm pretty sure everything is covered, inshallah. So, what makes up the basal ganglia? We have the caudate nucleus, we have the putamen, subthalamic nuclei, substantial niagara, and, um, wait, yeah, we have basically a caudate nucleus, we have the putamen, we have the subthalamic, the substantia niagara, and the globus pallidus. All of these make up the basal ganglia. Hello? We have from the thalamus, we talked about the thalamus, now we're going to talk about the basal ganglia. Okay? Now the subthalamic nucleus is not like, it's not part of the basal ganglia, but it's, it has, it's an important regulator in the uh, basically um, um, what was that called? The the pathways that we're gonna talk about. Now, before we go into the pathway, okay, guys, I want you to focus with me here. We have to know and know during rust, okay. Okay, before during rust. So keep in mind, and know the thalamus, okay, the thalamus always wants to excite the cortex. So if you can see here, we have a green arrow from the thalamus to the cortex. It always wants to excite it. Come on. So the thalamus, if it's not affected by anything, it, it will excite the cortex. Hello? Okay. Other than that, another important information is, and no, during rust, rust, guys, okay? Like there is no, D1 is not active, D2 is not active, nothing is active. Just during rust, the pars reticulata. And the G, the globus pallidus internus, both of them inhibit the thalamus. This is during growth. We're not even talking about any pathway. So the thalamus usually is inhibited by pars reticulata and the GPI or the globus pallidus internus. And because it's inhibited, the thalamus is not uh, is not active and it doesn't activate the cortex. Hello, is this clear? This is what we're going to base all of the um like different pathways on come on so the pars reticulata and the gpi they usually inhibit the thalamus therefore the thalamus is inactive this is on during growth come on Allah. knowing that we can start talking about the direct pathway or the d1 pathway so Allah. what is why do we want the direct pathway the direct pathway is there so okay wait let's say so we have direct and indirect pathway the direct pathway is basically the pathway that allows movement. Come on. But basically, we're gonna we're we're gonna walk. Come on. Allah into when you walk, one of your legs, so basically this is you walking. So one of your legs is standing and the other is moving. So the movement of this leg is usually due to the direct pathway. 
تمام طبعا الموفمنت اي مين اي دونت مين موفمنت باي موفمنت اي مين كوردينيتد موفمنت موفمنت ذات هاز بروبيسبتيف لايك لايك ذا ذا موست the the best thing of the movement because we know and like okay motor function comes from the cortex صح بس كمان we need to fine regulate and and make sure that the movement is done in the best way possible so this is the job of the basal ganglia so basically احنا when we move this leg that is moving we have the direct pathway in here so the direct pathway ensure movement an indirect pathway what is like what's going to do it's going to inhibit the leg that's not walking so we don't fall over like if you're walking with both legs at the same time without like You can't, you know, think of it. You can't go from one place to another. And uh, this is one place. You want to go here. You have to walk here. صح? You know, you have to stand and then walk. You're not going to jump with both feet. So basically, one has to move and one is not going to move. So, uh, so the one is that the, the part that is moving is the D2. Uh, sorry, the D1, which is the direct pathway. And the part that is not moving, the leg that is uh, standing still and not moving, it's the D2. Or the indirect pathway. Hello? Hello, they always coexist. And uh, but, uh, this is not important. The most important thing is now we're going to talk about how does it work. Come on. So we want to move. And um, I want to move my leg and I want to move it in the best way possible. So what will happen? The cortex, the motor side of the cortex is going to send a a uh, signal this signal chafin high cortex it's going to send a signal where will the signal go it's going to go to two places it's going to directly go to the striatum and it's going to go to the pars compacta of the substantia majora hello so it's going to activate the striatum and it's going to activate the pars compacta come on now You can see they're green. So green means an agglutinate, so it's active, excitatory. So it's going to excite, excite the striatum and it's going to excite the first compactor. And the most important thing, the D1 and the D2 are usually acted upon by the substantia Niagara. Okay? So, so the substantia is the one that acts on D1 and D2. So when the, the most important, like, okay, the cortex is going to activate the striatum, but the, 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 the force behind this activity and the thing that makes sure that the activity is going on is the substantia nigra and the pars compacta. Because the, this, this, and is the part that's going to act on the D1 and the D2 receptors. Hello? Hello. So, okay, the cortex sends a signal. It activates the striatum. It activates the pars compacta. What will happen next? The pars compacta are going to activate D1. Come on. So the D1 receptor is activated. What does D1 do? The D1 is going to stimulate the striatum to release GABA, which is an inhibitory Um, basically neurotransmitting. So GABA is released from the striatum into the globus pallidus internus and the pars reticulata. So it's going to inhibit their normal movement. What was the normal function of pars reticulata and globus pallidus? Their normal function was to inhibit the thymus. So if you inhibit their function, you're technically inhibiting the inhibition that happens to the thalamus. And what happens is the thalamus is going to be activated and it's going to activate the cortex to basically perform the movement. Do you guys get it? It's actually really simple, but it's, it's just, you know, like this inhibiting whatever, like inhibiting something that already inhibits. You get me? That's the confusing part. But other than that, it's really easy. Guys, is this clear? Or do you guys have questions? Or do you want me to repeat? I don't mind repeating. Mm, I'm not going to move on until I'm pretty sure I know guys into front to D1 pathway or the direct pathway. Mm, are there any questions? Yes. Halas, I move on. Oh, clear. Perfect. So, 
Um, since it's all clear, we can move on into the next one. Uh -huh. So this is the direct pathway. Close them in, oh my God. Close them in the direct pathway. I included Dr. Um, like Yachin's slide just to explain on it because I know this is the slide that you're gonna study from. So the idea again is the cortex is gonna activate the striatum and it's gonna activate the substantia nigra, uh, specifically the pars compacta, and it's gonna act on D1. Come on, it's gonna activate D1. And like usually, sorry, it's gonna send, this is, they say it's, okay, it's gonna activate D1. Come on, what will D1 do? D1 is gonna send inhibitory, so it's gonna inhibit GPI, okay? Now GPI, what does it usually do? It usually inhibits the thalamus. So you can see how in here we have inhibitory pathways to the thalamus. So this inhibitory inhibitory pathway is gonna be is gonna go a lot. We're not gonna have inhibition to the thalamus. And you see how pronounced this activation is. So it's gonna excite the cortex. So this is the idea. Come on. I hope it's clear. Honestly, when I checked your slides at the beginning, I couldn't understand this. This guy then BNB really helped me. So if I didn't help you enough, you can guys go check BNB. It's really good. Uh, moving on, so we finished the direct pathway. Now the indirect pathway. Hala, again, we said the indirect pathway, we're going to inhibit, so we're moving. One leg is um, moving and the other is not. So we want to, basically, indirect pathway is going to act on the leg that's in, not moving. Okay, so we're going to go through the D2 pathway. D2, the same thing, like the, it's the same start, come on. Um, we're going to have the cortex is going to send uh, excited theory, it's going to activate the any, the pars compacta and the striatum. Okay, the pars compacta is not going to act on D1 anymore, it's going to act on D2. Hello, it's going to act on D2. So, when D2 is D2 is in action, it's going to stimulate the striatum to send out inhibitory neurotransmitters, which is GABA, to the globus pallidus externus, okay? Now the globus pallidus externus, when we are in rust, what does it do? It prevents the subthalamic nucleus from acting, come on. So is that we go back here, I should mention that. Grab the globus pallidus externus, its normal activity when we don't have any stimulation is to prevent the subthalamic nucleus from working. Why? Because if the subthalamic nucleus works, come on, it's going to increase the activity of globus pallidus internus, making the thalamus more inhibited than it usually is because it's going to like it's gonna excite the GPI and be like, yellow, yellow, work more, more, more. So it's gonna, so if the subthalamic nucleus is active, the thalamus is like, mobus, not polarized. It's like high, like, like way, 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 way below. Okay. It's not gonna act like, not in a million years. Okay. So, in the indirect pathway, so basically, it's gonna inhibit the globus pallidus externus. Now, the glue of pallidus externus usually inhibits the subthalamic nuclei, but now it's gone. It's no longer inhibiting the subthalamic nuclei. So the subthalamic nuclei, what will it do? It's going to increase, it's going to activate GPI more and more. So GP, the globus pallidus internus, is going to increase the inhibitory neural sense of the thalamus. Therefore, the thalamus is going to be inhibited, and the cortex is not going to be excited so it's going to be inhibited is this clear do you guys have any questions i know it's a lot honestly d1 and d2 were confusing to me but i feel like it's okay, and you can manage. Was it clear, guys? Okay, I'm gonna take the silence as it was all clear. Yeah, it was. It was? Okay. Yep. So, 
So now we know what the direct and indirect pathways are. I want to come on. This is the doctor uh, it means like one. So basically the cortex activates the striatum and it activates the pars compacta, which act on D2. D2, what will it do? It's going to inhibit the function of globus pallidus externus. So when we inhibit the function of globus pallidus externus, we're removing the inhibition on the subthalamic nuclei. So when the subthalamic nuclei is not inhibited, it's going to increase the activity of globus pallidus internus. And what's the activity of, what's the normal activity of GPI? Inhibiting the thalamus. Therefore, we're going to inhibit any movement. Hello? Hello. Now, basically, the subthalamal collegial projection that comes from the subthalamus is the only excitatory intrinsic connection of the basal ganglia. So all of the things that are inside the basal ganglia usually are GABA, uh, mod, like GABA dominated, and they're all inhibited, except for a subthalamal collegial projection. And it's excitatory and it excites the GPI to work even more on inhibiting the thalamus. No? So now, since we discussed the basal ganglia, so the the like um hi, where it's important to mention the diseases, so. So basically, we have three main diseases they want. Ignore the wisdom. It's part of the, what is it called? It's part of the BMB. So just never mind it. Now we have to focus on Parkinson's, Huntington's, and hemibilism. Okay? So actually, it's hemibilism. So that's whatever. First of all, Parkinson's. What do you guys know about Parkinson? You know, and basically they're hypokinetic. Hypokinetic means they don't move fast. They're missing slow. They're very hard to initiate movement. Um, basically, they have uh, the pill rolling tremor. They have the cogwheel, uh, basically, movement or posture. Come on. So, uh, because all of this, Again, a Parkinson's is hypokinetic. It's a hypokinetic thing. So if we think of hypokinetic, which which pathway do you think it is? Is it D1 or D2 that is the stronger? I want someone to unmute and tell me. D2. D2. Exactly. So the D2 is going to take over. Hello? The D2 is going to take over. It's going to be the dominant one. Because D2 usually prevents movement. But then we're saying hypokinetic, that we don't have a lot of movement. So D2 is the stronger one in Parkinson's. So as you can see, pars reticulata is the one that's affected. Why? Because pars reticulata, um, since the pars reticulata is the one infected, uh, affected, when the striatum comes and, uh, and uh, like, masana, let's say, if, if the striatum comes and activates it, um, it's not going to work on D D1. Like, okay, let's come back here. So you see how basically the D1, so you see how the, the, the this, the, like the, the SN is going to act on D1. It's not going to, it's no longer going to act on D1. And what happens is the pars reticulata will be stronger inhibiting the thalamus. Come on. Another one we have, another disease we have is the Huntington's. Now Huntington's, Huntington's. The problem with Huntington's is the striatum. So the striatum is going to be um, affected. And because the striatum is affected, it's, it's going to become hyperkinetic. Hyperkinetic means it's going to have more, the D1 is going to be the dominant one, and it's going to cause um, like uh, movements, like a lot of little chorea, like uh, unwanted movements. And we have hemibilismus. Uh, hemibilismus is uh, basically an um, like an infarct or, an, or, or um, a problem that happens in the subthalamic nucleus. And you know what's the main like function of the sub subthalamic nucleus? It's in it's basically activating or making GPI more stronger, further inhibiting the thalamus. But if the subthalamic nucleus is gone, we're not going to have a strong inhibitory effect on the thalamus, so it's going to be hyperkinetic. Come on, come on. Now we're going to talk more in details about each like disease. Um, so Parkinson's, come on. Do Parkinson's, we have the dopamine is deficient, come on. So we're gonna have hypokinetic signs. And I mentioned in here like hypokinetic, so D2 is gonna be stronger than D1. So what happens is we're gonna have decreased dopamine. So the D1 
my dog. The D1 is not going to be affected. Like the D1 is not going to be stimulated. So since the D1 is not going to be stimulated, it's the, the, the GPI is going to do its normal job of basically inhibiting the thalamus. So it's going to inhibit the thalamus, okay, normally. This is through D1. But what happens is D2 is enhanced. Okay, the D2 activity is extremely enhanced, and what happens, the globus internus will no longer inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. So the, the subthalamic nucleus is going to increase its GPI's activity. So basically, first of all, D1 is not going to be, it's not going to work. So the it's not going to inhibit globus pallidus internus, and globus pallidus internus will go on with its life doing its normal job, which is inhibiting the thalamus. And D2 is going to be enhanced and its activity is going to increase and uh, it will uh, basically prevent globus pallidus externus from doing its normal job. It's going to inhibit it and this inhibition of globus pallidus externus is going to cause the subthalamus, the subthalamic nuclei to be basically freed from the inhibition by GPE and it's going to increase the activity of globus pallidus internus or GPI basically making the inhibition of the activity of the thalamus even more pronounced. So what happens is we're not going to have movement in the thalamus. So we're going to have a reduced outflow in the corticospinal and the corticobulbal tracts, and we're going to have reduced production of motor behaviors. So it's hypokinesia, or we're going to have hypokinetic uh, disorder. Is it clear? So as you can guys see, He's going to have slow shuffling feet movement. It's going to be so hard to initiate movement. The, the most, I mean, the most, the hardest thing in Parkinson is initiating the movement. Once he initiates the movement, خلاص, he can move on Adi. Uh, we're going to have basically cogwheel rigidity. So basically, like, you know, like, like if he wants to, like, let's say I want to take this pencil. I don't have Parkinson's, alhamdulillah. So basically, I'm not going to be, I'm going to just take it. But a person with Parkinson is just going to stop in every single thing until he takes it this is the cogwheel rigidity you know how a cogwheel goes so you know how it stops like one two three four so it's gonna stop in every single one they're gonna have pill rolling tremor um i don't know there's, there's just a way of describing the tremor because the tremor is gonna be like like this kind of they're like rolling a pill and uh, their face is gonna be like expressionless because cortical bulbers uh cortical bulbar uh basically because thicko bulbar pathway is affected, so they're not gonna be able to like you know smile and like things in an active way. Come on, they're gonna be able. I'm not. I'm not saying they're gonna be like like paralyzed, but I mean, uh, no, it's gonna be slow and it's hard to show these like emotions and so on. Come on, this is everything about Parkinson. If you guys have any question, please tell me. Um, moving on. I'm going to, like, now we're going to talk about Huntington. Huntington, um, it's a hyperkinetic. So what do we mean by hyperkinetic? We mean in G1 is stimulated more than D2. Okay, is there a question? Okay, there's no question. So, so basically, in Huntington, it's a hyperkinetic, so D1 activity is stronger than D2 and a dominance of D1 over D2. So what happens is, and no, D2 is not going to be, خلاص, the D2 is no longer going to be activated. So when we don't activate D2, what does this mean? And GPE is not going to, so the GPE is not going to be inhibited. So it's going to basically prevent the subthalamic nuclei from sending anything. So the subthalamic nuclei is not going to work. Come on. This is what D2 like loss means. Not only does it not activate D2 or a tolos, it also activates D1. So when D1 is activated, it's going to send inhibitory signals and a GPI. So when it sends inhibitory, uh, never mind this X, guys. This X is a mistake. Relax. These inhibitory signals are going to be sent. Come on. So... After the D2, D1 is activated, inhibitory signals are going to be sent to GPI. Come on. 
after we send these inhibitory signals, GPI is no longer going to do its normal job. So it's no longer going to gonna inhibit the thalamus. But actually, this, this, you know, the thalamus is now free from GPI. So what happens is that the thalamus is gonna, uh, is gonna basically send excitatory uh, neurotransmitters to the cortex, uh, basically causing the movement to happen. So in Huntington, what happens is, you know, the D2 is gone and the D1 is taking over because D1 is, because D2 is gone, the subthalamic nucleus is gone from on and only D1 is the active thing. So D1 is gonna basically uh, inhibit GPI, and the thalamus is going to be free to send as much uh, excitatory neurons as uh, like neurotransmitters as possible. So we see that we hyperkinesia or hyperkinetic signs. What are these hyperkinetic signs? Choreo, choreo, which is basically uh, dysregulated movement. Um, uh, basically, it's um, rapid, uh, unintentional. Uh, so you can see here we have basically jerking movements in the distal parts of the lower limbs. We have twitching movements of the head, grimacing movements in the face, uh, basically movements of the arms. So basically we're going to have unintentional or involuntary, uh, basically like again, like movements, you know, jerking of the head. So they're going to they're gonna like kind of have increased activity of all of the movements. So they're going to have basically, as you can see, their legs are going to jerk, their arms are going to like go like this, his face is, he's grimacing all the time. So I think this is the opposite. So hunting, we have grimacing movements and face, lips and tongue. But in, in Parkinson, we have basically a mask-like facial expression. So they're not able to express anything. So on. And in there, it's, it's hard to initiate movement. On, we have over, um, like uh, expression of movement. Hello? I think it's clear. Is it clear? Do you guys have any questions? Okay, I'm gonna take the silence as it's clear and easy and everything is nice. Now, hemibilismus. It's also hyperkinetic. That's how that is. The issue with hemibilismus is, remember at the beginning of the slide, I'll show you. To show you my thoughts. Remember in here. So remember, um, yep, here. Remember when we said in the subthalamus, if we have a legion, we're going to have hemibilismus, and it has to do with the D2 cycle. So now we're going to talk about hemibilismus. Okay. So what happens in hemibilismus is we have a stroke or an infarct, or we have, um, I don't know, ischemia, anything that affects the subthalamic nucleus. So if the subthalamic nucleus is gone, and we can see, guys, in Nanahna, all over this, the subthalamic, oh, sorry, no. Oh, yeah, so this, we have, okay, I have a, okay, there's a mistake here, guys. It's not this, the X is not on the Niagara, it's on here, okay? Ignore the sex. You know what? I'm kind of discarding it. One second. I'll just remove it because it's kind of silly. Okay. So we have a subthalamic nuclei legion. So you see this X here? This is what happens. We know that the subthalamic nuclei, what does it do? A subthalamic nuclei makes sure and no, no, um, so it makes sure and no V. Okay, so the subthalamic nucleus usually it sends excitatory, okay, to the excitatory uh, signals, the globus pallidus internus. Why does it do that? It does that to activate or make, make the GPI more active. So it increases the inhibition of the thalamus. That's the normal function of the subthalamus, okay? And the subthalamus is gone, then the GPI is not going to be affected. And not only that, D1 is uh, sorry, D1 is going to work adi, but D2 is not going to be uh, is, is not going to work anymore. So the D2 is not going to work. The subthalamus nucleus is not going to work. So what happens is that the GPI is no longer going to exert its inhibitory, um, basically. We, uh, inhibitory uh, signals on the thalamus and the thalamus is going to be free to basically uh, uh, send excitatory 
uh, new neurotransmitters and signals to the cortex as much as it wants. And that's why we have amebalisma. Okay? So the most important thing is anu'anu. And subthalamic nucleus is gone. Yani, listen, listen. D2, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, D2 is not affected in here. Yani, the difference between hemibalismas and Huntington is, and, no, and Huntington, D2 is the one that's affected in here. D2 is not affected. It's normal. But think of it. Even if it's normal, and if it tries, if, if, it's, if it stops sending negative things, sorry, the subthalamus, and if we don't have an activity from the subthalamus, then, then it's not going to work. Because subthalamus is really important in D2. So the D2 is not going to be like, like, I don't want to confuse you. And you're going to be like, oh, so what's the difference between Huntington and here? And here, the subthalamic nuclei is affected. And Huntington D2 is affected. But in here, D2 is going to be normal. And even if we stimulate D2, it's not going to do anything because the subthalamic nucleus is not, going to, is not working anyways. So D1 is going to be the dominating one. And it's going to always be active regardless of anything. Come on. That's why, that's why we have hemibalism. That's everything for the direct and direct for the different, um, basically, legions and uh, disorders of the basal ganglia. I hope you guys understood them. Uh, lastly, there is this slide, which I really don't understand why is it really important, but uh, just know, just know that we have four key functional loops that goes through the basal ganglia, and it has to do with skeletal motor. So skeletal motor means the skeleton and motor function. So it has to do with the, the, the movement, the limb trunks and facial muscles. Then we have oculomotor. It has to do with the eyes, prefrontal for cognitive, basal ganglia and so on. And then we have the limbic, which is regulation of behavioral emotions. Um, um, you need know, just memorize it. Just know that we have four. And each one, you know, from the name, you can know what it is, skeletal motor. A movement of the body, face, limb, trunks, everything. Ocular motor, it has to do with the eyes, movement of the extraocular muscles. Um, prefrontal cortex loop, it has to do with emotions, cognitive, executive, limbic, emotions, behavior. You get me? I just included it just to be like, to make sure that I don't miss anything because I really don't want to miss anything. But is it clear up till now? Guys, I don't want to move on to the cerebellum without making sure you guys know everything in the basal ganglia. Thalamus, basal ganglia, are they okay? They're saying in the chat that it is. It is? Okay, perfect. Come on. On the back of basal ganglia, we have last but not least the cerebellum. Okay? Cerebellum. It's a cute organ. It's like a brain by itself, and if you think of it, it's, I'm not saying it is a brain by itself, but I know it's a small structure under the, so basically we have the brain and then we have the, like the, the midbrain and the, what's it called? The brain stem going out, but then Anna, then we have the cerebellum, okay? So what's the function? What's the main function of the cerebellum? It's making sure that the movement is, coordinated, making sure that the movement is perfect, making sure that, so it's basically, it's the system that, so basal ganglia is for the movement. So basal ganglia is there for a movement and it's kind of like, makes sure the movement is done like, hyperkinetic or hyper, like it's done perfectly. Cerebellum modulates and fine regulates this movement even more, okay? Hello, we have three lobes. We have three peduncles, we have three deep nuclei, we have three layers of cells, and we have three functional divisions and three blood vessels. This is important. Um, the doctor mentioned the three blood vessels, but they weren't in the lecture. Uh, just know, I don't know what are the three blood vessels, but I just know them. But we have three lobes, and we have something called three functional divisions. So we have three anatomical lobes, which are basically the anterior lobe is you can see here we have anterior lobe we have posterior lobe and we have the follicular nodular lobe in here okay so anterior posterior and uh basically follicular nodular those are the three lobes we have three peduncles the three peduncles are basically the superior middle and inferior and um we have them here superior middle and inferior and they're kind of basically 
So the middle and the inferior, there are the inputs to the cerebellum and they usually come from the head and the spine. And then we have the superior cerebellar peduncle is the way out of the cerebellum but into the basically the brain, I think, okay? Um, this is the peduncles. And then we have three deep nuclei. We're gonna talk about them. We have three layers of cells. We're gonna talk about them. And we have three functional divisions. Uh, three functional divisions are these, the spinal cerebellum, the cerebral cerebellum, and the vestibular cerebellum. And they're called functional divisions just because they literally uh, tell us what the pathways are and uh, what are they involved in. Hello? Hello. So that's all you need to know. Three lobes, anterior, posterior, floccular, nodular, three peduncles, uh, superior, middle, inferior, three deep nuclei, we're going to say them, three layers of cells, we're going to say them, three functional divisions, spinal cerebellar, cerebral cerebellum, and uh, vestibular cerebellum. I don't know. I didn't get them, but I think you guys know them. Anyways, uh, let's start with in three layers of cells. Hello? We have three layers of cells. We have them. Hmm. Sorry. Okay. We have three layers of cells. We have the molecular layer, we have the Purkinje cell layer, and we have the granular cell layer. Come on. And we have two different, okay. So we have two different fibers. We have three different cells. And we have three different layers. Hello? Hello. Hello. Faraha, I'll tell you something. I didn't really understand the the, the cells from the lecture. So I asked ChatGPT, that's why I wrote credit to ChatGPT. Um, and it kind of helped me understand what they are. Um, so we have something called climbing fibers and something called mostly fibers. And the climbing fibers, they are fibers that specifically come, meaning the inferior olivary nucleus. Okay? That's all you need to know. Climbing, when you hear climbing, Inferior olivary nuclei, it, it's not climbing. So you can see how it literally climbs. It climbs all the way into the Purkinje cell and it literally wraps around the Hello? And the idea is, and every climbing fiber only climbs on one Purkinje cell. So the climbing fiber goes to one, it climbs all over and like rotates all over one Purkinje cell. And it usually comes from the inferior olivary nuclei. Now, everything else, everything, literally everything else, the vestibular system, spinal cord, cerebral cortex, et cetera, they go through the mossy fibers. And the mossy fibers, they're not like the climbing fibers. They don't climb and go to the Purkinje. They are kind of a little bit like, so basically you can think of climbing fibers are clingy. They cling to the Purkinje fiber um, and drop around it. But the mossy fiber is like, I don't want to cling around you. So what does it do? It takes the the all of the like signals and then it sends it to the granule cell. Okay. Now the granule cell, what will it do? It will slowly it the granule cell is gonna like you see how the granule cell, this is the but this is the cell body, and then it's gonna send axons that will form parallel fibers. Now parallel fibers we're gonna have so. The parallel fibers, if you see, we have only one Purkinje cell in here. But since it's a parallel fiber, it's going to basically come on, communicate with another Purkinje cell. So it's going to, so basically one granule cell or one, so mossy fiber, granule cell, those two, they're going to result in formation of a lot of parallel fibers. And those parallel fibers are going to um, basically sign up with multiple Purkinje fibers. Okay? Come on. This is this is uh, what you need to know. since they, what's important? So basically, after we sign up to the Purkinje, what happens is the Purkinje is the main way or main source of um, like um, like the main thing that goes to the deep cerebellar nuclear cell. So this it's gonna send its activity to the deep. Uh, so the Purkinje is the one, the main one. So I I can you I know you can guys see in a few mostly fiber and the uh, basically the the climbing are affecting the deep nuclei. I really don't care about this part. And Mohan, just to know another Purkinje cell is the main source of communication with the deep cerebellar nuclear cell. Hello. So what happens is the mostly fiber climbing fiber. What will they do? They will provide input to the cerebellum. So they're going to take input from all of the body and they're gonna go and give it to the Purkinje fiber. I don't care if it's my granule cell or whatever. 
So basically, uh, the granular cell is just going to basically process whatever the motor fiber gives it, and it's going to give it to the Purkinje cell. Now, the Purkinje cell, what will it do? It will integrate the information. It will take all of these information. So we have information from the head, we have information from the body, we have information from everywhere. It's going to take all of this information, it's going to integrate it, and based on that information, it's going to either activate the deep cerebellar nuclear cell or inhibit the, uh, the deep uh, cerebellar nuclear. Come on. Regardless of what it does, the, the important thing is in a deep cerebellar nuclear, what does it do? It ensures and no, in motor commands, are smooth and coordinated. That's all. What, that's all what we care about. I don't really like. In the lecture, there was not a specific way of what happens. So, all you need to know, guys, and know we have three different layers: granule cell layer, Purkinje cell layer, molecular layer. We have climbing fibers that are gonna climb all over the Purkinje cell. They're going to send information from where and where all of your nuclei specifically. Ala el Purkinje fiber. El uh, mossy fiber is going to sign up. So the granule cell and the granule cell is going to uh, send parallel fibers that will sign up with more than one Purkinje fiber, sending all of the data from the body. And if you think of it, guys, since the mossy fiber sends a lot of a lot of information because it's from all over the body, then it makes sense and no, it causes, it forms uh, parallel fibers and it uh, basically uh, sign up with more, more than one Purkinje fiber. And I don't know. We need the huge input. The, the climbing fiber is only from one thing, which is the inferior liver nucleus, so we really don't care. So, moving on, um, after we send the, re the information to the to the uh, Purkinje fiber, the Purkinje, Purkinje cell actually, so the Purkinje cell is gonna process all of the information, and it's going, so based on all of the information, it's gonna process it, it's gonna integrate it and everything. Based on all of the information, it's gonna either activate or inhibit, or it will send whatever output to the deep cerebellar nuclei. And this output is gonna ensure and you know, we have coordinated smooth movement. That's all. That's all you need to know. Come on. Come on. And now we're gonna talk specifically about the anatomical and function of the vision. Um, but, okay, so. OSG anatomical, literally only anterior, posterior lobe, and fallopian nodular. That's, that's okay. Like, there's nothing much to say about the anatomical divisions. But the most important uh, thing to talk about is the functional divisions. Why are they important? They're important because, uh, okay, they're important because they are the ones that are responsible to for the different uh, functions and uh, like the pathways, the cerebellum. Come on. So, First of all, we have cerebrocerebellum. Cerebrocerebellum, if you think of it, cerebrocerebellum, it, it contains the cerebro and the cerebellum. Come on. And if you can look at it, it's the lateral side. So this 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 color, the whole like burgundy color, uh, or maroon, it's the one that is it has to do with the cerebrocerebellum, and they're laterally there. So it's just uh, responsible for motor planning. If you think of it, cerebro, cerebellum. So cerebro, from the cerebrum, okay? So it's going to mainly take a motor movement, okay? A motor planning and learn, uh, learning of skilled movement. You know? When we say motor planning, we know and if we want to move, where does the, the planning come from? It's cerebrum. So we have motor planning from the cerebrum, it's a motor planning and learning of skilled movement, anything that has to do with the brain. So if you want to move, motor planning and learning of skilled movements, this is basically it has to do with the cerebral cerebrum. Example. So what's an example of cerebral cerebellum? What does it do? It's basically picking a water bottle. Come on. And when you want to pick a water bottle, we have to make sure this is not a water bottle. But any, if I want to pick an object, whatever object I want to pick, okay? Um, we have to make sure, and basically, the the hug has to plan it to eventually result in a formation of a skilled movement. Because uh, like grabbing something is not easy. It involves a lot of different things in our body, and it has to do with more than one sense. So come on, it has to do with the proprioception, everything of the body. So we execute it in a skilled manner. Hello. But uh, basically, uh, if we have a lesion to the cerebrocerebellum, what happens is, and uh, no, the we're gonna have something called intention tremor. Intention tremor is basically it's called intention tremor, but technically it's unintentional. So basically, when you wanna do something, so I'm going to grasp something, I'm gonna start having a tremor, okay? Because 
So it, it comes with basically um, like when you're attempting to, to, to do something and it's usually like it's when you're intending to do something, you're going to have a tremor. OK. So an intention tremor is related to the cerebrocerebellum. Cerebrocerebellum it's basically with the head, like with the head, <laughs> with the brain, with the cerebrum. But I know it's part of the cerebrum. We have motor planning and the basically like literally the execution of funk of uh, of a cells function like picking up something. Hello? And if we have an agent, intention tremor. And it's usually in the lateral side of the head. So basically it has to do with all of the blood. Then we have a spinocerebellum, okay? Spinocerebellum is made from the vermis and the perivermis. It's just this area. So you see the vermis, this is the vermis. And the perivermis is basically the things that are around the vermis. So, uh, so the vermis and the perivermis are going to make up the spinocerebellum. A spinocerebellum has to do with limbs. And also, it's my spinocerebellum. So it brings stuff from the spinal cord. The spinal cord. What does it relay information from? It relay information from the different from our limbs, okay? The peripherals, the peripheries, okay? So what happens is uh, spinal cerebellum has to do with the limbs. And uh, basically an example of what function it executes is just normal walking or basically the way you stand, your proprioception, because we're saying spinal cerebellum, it takes things from the, uh, the limbs. So basically it has to do with the proprioception of the limbs. Where is my hands currently? Where is my feet currently? And so on. Come on. If we have a legion to this, what happens is we're going to have ataxia. I'm pretty sure you guys know what an ataxia is. Ataxia is basically a kind of an imbalance. Um, I don't know how to explain ataxia specifically, but I'm pretty sure you guys covered what ataxia is. Um, but it'll be said an ataxia like like there's not going to be a balanced movement so if you're going to walk it's not going to be like a normal gait a healthy gait where you like one feet uh, it's going to be an ataxic gait they're going to be like waddling go heck come on um so again cerebral cerebellum if we have an issue the an intention tremor uh spinal cerebellum if we have an issue we're going to have ataxia specifically we're going to have limp ataxia come on uh, moving on, and the vestibular cerebellum. The vestibular cere cerebellum is literally has to do with the saphenia and follicular lobe, this bad lobe in here, literally. It's going to be like hectic. Like so, um, you see this? This is the vestibular cerebellum. It's like a normal hiccup protruding. Come on. Um, what else? Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, so the vestibular cerebellum, it's no vestibulo, vestibulo, يعني نحنا عنا vestibular body, vestibular body, what is this specific, what is this function? Balance, 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 balance. So, it has to do with the balance of our body and the movement of our eyes, okay? So, vestibulo uh, cerebellar uh, is, is important in two things, movement of our eyes, and balance. Okay. So in this, we talked about the anatomical divisions, anterior, posterior, flocculo, uh, sorry, yeah, anterior, posterior, and flocculonodular lobe. And then we talked about the functional, which is cerebrocerebellum, uh, vestibular cerebellum, and the spinal cerebellum. This is clear, so it's easy. Now we're going to talk about the three deep nuclei. So guys, just to keep, we have three anatomical lobes, three functional divisions. Now we're going to talk about the three deep nuclear uh, cerebellar nuclei. So, then we have three main ones. And who have vestigian, nucleus interpostus, and then face. But the nucleus interpostus is made up of two, which is the globus nucleus and the emboliform nucleus. So, uh, now we're talking about the most um, interior. Okay. Yeah. No, better. So we're starting off with the vestigial nucleus. So the vestigial nucleus is related to balance and movement of trunk and eyes. You can see that the vestigial is literally in here, in the middle, in the verma. So it makes sense and it has to do with the movement of the trunk because we said that no, it is mainly related to basically movement. Come on. Uh, and then we have basically, okay. 
And then we have the nucleus interposus, okay, which is those two. And they are related to the movement of the limbs, especially the lower limbs. Okay. the movement of the trunk, okay. And then we have move and the movement of eyes. So the vestigial nucleus, balance, and eyes. Okay, middle and vestibular. And not only that, but command, we have movement of the trunk. So eyes, balance, and the trunk. Then we go more like, like down to the limbs, okay? Which, which is done by the nucleus interposus. So basically think of it like those eyes. And balance, you can think of ears. Like we know that the, the cochlear, vestibular cochlear is somewhere close to the ears. And the trunk, come on. <laughs> so this is the vestigial nucleus. But then visual limbs, come on. Which is basically, specifically lower limbs by a nucleus interposus. Last but not least, the dentate nucleus is like the big boss. It just makes sure and everything is planned and skilled. Also, you can see its position. Its position is literally in the cerebrocerebellum, and this is the function of the cerebrocerebellum. These are the functions of basically spinocerebellum, and this is basically, it has to do with a uh, follicular cerebellum. Huh? Now we're going to discuss the uh, pathways, okay? For, um, for the pathways, okay. I want Abin Maruhal pathways, guys. Is there any question? Is everything and the like everything I just mentioned was it clear? Okay, I'll just take the silence as yes. <laughs> Everything is clear, sir. Yep, it is. Okay. Come on. So, basically, hello. We're gonna talk about the different pathways. Now it's kind of easy now that we like okay posterior cerebellar, or the cerebrocerebellum. We already talked about what cerebrocerebellum function is. So the cerebrocerebellum function is to basically uh, plant skill movement. So we want to correct them. We want to make sure that they're okay. They're, they're, they're executed in the proper way. And we said, you know, it's in the peripheral. We said here, and the dentate nucleus, like in here, the dentate nucleus is in the periphery. So it's, it makes sense, you know, it's related to the dentate nucleus and it has to do with plant skill and movement. So what happens is, okay, let's follow the lines. Hey, cortex, okay. So cortex is gonna go all the way, okay. And it gonna, it's gonna go through the internal capsule into the, um basically it's gonna go from the internal capsule lel pons okay it's gonna go internal capsule lead to the pons come on after it goes into the pons it pons is gonna through the middle cerebellar peduncle this is an important thing middle cerebellar peduncle so through the middle cerebellar peduncle it's going to enter the and in cerebellum hello we have two um, we have to like focus on two things. The superior cerebellar peduncle is the only peduncle that takes things out of the cerebellum to the cortex. So in all of these pathways, it always ends up with the superior uh, cerebellar, cere cerebellar peduncle taking the, uh, the information or whatever signal to the cortex. Hello? Hello. The middle and the inferior is the, they, they are the usual, basically, um, like there is the usual, wait, and a white drink. Oh, wait, maybe. Oh, I drank with them. Anyways, so the, the middle and the inferior cerebellar peduncles are the ones that take information into the, um, into the cerebellum. And specifically, inferior, because it's the lowest, and if you can think of it, inferior, what comes from down of the spinal cord? So basically, inferior is usually uh, responsible for taking all the information from the spinal cord and the whole, like the, the peripheral body. And then we have the middle, it brings the, all of the corticopontine, everything from the brain and the brain stem uh, into the cerebellum, okay? And then it leaves out of the cerebellum through the superior peduncle. 
So what happens is it goes, as you see, it went to the pontine or the pond, and then it's projected through the medial cerebellar, the medial cerebellar to the fill into the cerebellum. Where did it land into the dentate nucleus? If it goes land the dentate nucleus, the dentate nucleus, what will it do? It will basically process the information and it's going to release a signal back into the brain to, for the appropriate way uh, of it to uh, basically like execute whatever movement you want. Come on. Hello. What happens is, is it trying to dentate? After it goes into the dentate, it's going to go from the dentate up into the pontine, the pons again. Okay. Actually, now we're, I think, yeah, now we're at where? We're at the midbrain. So, yeah, so it's going to go all the way up to the midbrain and then it's going to decrustate. So, it's going to go and shift, crosses the line and goes into the contralateral side. Hello? That's an important thing. So, it crosses the midline and forms the decrustation. And I'm pretty sure you guys took in the cerebellum, like when you took the, the midbrain, that you went over the cerebellar uh, decrustation. But uh, what happens is, uh, no. Again, from the cortex, goes to the pons, from the pons, it enters the cerebellum through the middle, middle cerebral peduncle and goes into the dentate nucleus. Why? Because we're talking about the cerebral cerebellum. So it goes into the, um, what is it called? Dentate nucleus. The dentate nucleus will process everything. It's going to send the output on the uh, midbrain where it will decustate and then goes up uh, from the ventral lateral thalamus into the cortex. Um, so, uh, pop quiz, what does the ventral lateral thalamus take care of? Do you guys remember? It's actually a very stupid question. Let's remember at the beginning of the, of the lecture when we said that the ventral lateral nucleus of the thalamus has to do with motor uh, movement from the cerebellum. So literally, you can guys know it's basically motor. So it, it goes into the thalamus, the VL in the thalamus takes it from the cerebellum, little brain. Come on. You see how everything is connected in this lecture? In Mohan, so this is the cerebral cerebellum. We just have to know, and know it has to do with uh, correction of plant skill movement. Come on. So we're correcting whatever skilled movement we want. And um, not only that, after we correct in plant skill movement, we do it through the dentate nucleus and uh, what? How does the information go into the cerebellum? It goes through the middle cerebral, um, middle cerebral, uh, middle cerebral peduncle, and it leaves through the superior. Hello, and I guys like this is, this is something I wrote myself from your notes. Uh, this is everything Doctor Abdel Jabbar, sorry, Doctor Yaqeen explained like literally, but I made it in an easier way for you guys to just memorize. Come on. Moving on, we have the cerebral cerebellum. Moving on, we have the spinal cerebellum. Spinal cerebellum, name BG. It comes from the spinal cord. Yeah. Um. So, do you think there is much left, or can we take a break? Honestly, there is only like literally six slides left. All right, then let's continue. Yeah, I know in a prayer, like for a prayer break, but I have six slides, and I'm gonna go over them really, like. Fast enough. Shallow by four fifteen. I'll be done. Huh? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, guys. I'm like just speaking, speaking of back here. I'm jumping information on you. That's yeah. It's alright. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. Um. Tamam. Hello. We're going to the spinal cerebellar pathway. And if you guys remember, spinal cerebellar, yani it's in the vermis. Yani it has the interposed nuclei. Remember the position of the interposed. Sorry. Remember the position of the interposed nuclei. So basically, it has to do with the coordination of our movement in the lower limbs specifically. So basically, information is going to come in when the spinal cord. So the dorsal and the ventral spinal cerebral pathway is going to start. It's going to bring all the proprioceptive information, the proprioceptive information from where? From our muscles in our lower limbs, our, our feet, our, our knees, everything, where everything is there. Tamam? And it's going to enter the cerebellum through the inferior cerebral peduncle. Hello? Then it will join the interior part of the vermis and paravermis if they not really, and it's gonna go and go to the interposed nuclei. And then from the interposed nuclei, and go to the superior cerebellar peduncle, and then from the superior, it's gonna go to the red nuclei, affecting the different pathways. And the most important thing is that in the spinal cerebellar, 
everything is epilateral okay so it's gonna affect everything epilaterally so the, in, basically in the cerebrocerebellum things were contralateral here it's epilateral so it's literally so easy guys it's nothing it's just that everything in you know, a dorsal and ventral spinal cerebral pathways so those pathways the bad the spinal cord they're gonna go okay they're gonna come into the they're going to bring all of the proprioceptive information, everything about our muscles, our, our joints, everything about our neurons. And they're going to basically give those things to the cerebellum through what? Through the inferior peduncle, okay? The inferior cerebral peduncle. This inferior uh, cere cerebellar peduncle is going to stay ipsilateral. It's not going to move anywhere. It's going to go to the interposed nuclei. Now, we said before, you know, the interposed nuclei are related to the limbs. So what happens is the interposed nuclei, they're going to integrate everything. They're going to process the information. And then they're going to go out. The information is going to go out through the superior cerebral peduncle to the red nucleus uh, for whatever. Like if it's for the flexors, it's going to go to the ribrospinal pathway. If it's the extensors, it's going to be the vestibular spinal. If it's affecting the flexors and the extensors, it's going to go through the articular spinal. So whatever the movement is or whatever the output is, it's going to go to the different uh, pathways. Let's just know the basics. Inferior middle cerebellar goes and it stays ipsilateral and goes to the interposed nuclei. The interposed nuclei we the information is going to be sent out through the superior cerebral peduncle to whatever pathway it needs to target. This is the spinal cerebellar pathway, okay? So cerebral cerebellum uh, had to do with the dentate nucleus and for the execution of uh, skilled movement, correction of whatever skilled movement we're doing. Our spinal cerebellum has to do with the interposed nuclei and it's basically mainly for the movement and the proprioception and everything of our lower limbs. And it has to do with the, uh, what is it called? The, my bad, <laughs> the interposed nuclei. Omobus heck, cerebral cerebellum. We had our information from the middle cerebellar, uh, cerebellar peduncle. Why? Because it came from the brain, cerebral. In here, spinal, so it came from the inferior cerebellum. Okay? Okay. Last but not least, the last pathway is the vestibular cerebellum pathway. So it's easy. It goes from the vestibular nuclei, okay? Vestibular nuclei, we know the vestibular nuclei, where is it? It's in the, um, where is the vestibular nuclei? It's in the, I think, midbrain, I think. Or maybe in the brain itself, like, yeah, it's in the midbrain, hello? So the vestibular nuclei in the midbrain, maybe it's not. Guys, you know better. Is it in the midbrain or is it in the pons? I don't know. Mohan, wherever the vestibular nuclei is, okay, it starts from there. And then it's going to go into the inferior cerebellar peduncle because, come on, it's not from the brain. It's kind of like still from the, you know how the brain stem branches into the spinal cord. So anything that's spinal cord and brain stem, it goes through the inferior cerebral peduncle. So it goes through the inferior cerebral peduncle into the vestigial nucleus. What did we say? What's the function of the vestigial nucleus? The function of vestigial nucleus was uh, the movement of our eyes and balance. So, so also literally, as you can see here, the vestibular cerebellar, it has to do with the movement of your trunk and eyes. Okay, so what happens is, in, in the vestibular nuclei is going to send signals that inferior cerebellar through the input through the inferior cerebellar peduncle into the cerebellum. And it's going to go and go to the vestigial nucleus. We know in the vestigial nucleus, its function is to basically uh, maintain balance and the movements of our eyes, like to basically like overview and fine tune these movements. Hello? After it uh, basically integrates and processes whatever information the uh, inferior cerebellar peduncle sends it, we're going to have, it's going to leave the uh, cerebellum through the superior cerebellar peduncle, and it's going to go to the median longitudinal fasciculus, okay? Uh, and then from the median longitudinal fasciculus, it's going to go to the medial vestibular spinal pathway. I'm pretty sure you guys, I don't know if you guys took MLF in detail, but I don't think you did. Maybe you did. Uh, you take it more, I think, in SNF. Uh, it has to do with the, it has to do with our eyes, okay? So we know, I know, like, vestibular cerebellum has to do with balance and eyes. So 
So just no and no. It goes to the MLF because it has to do with the eyes, and then it goes through the vestibular uh, spinal pathway. Come on. Um, but then, so what happens is, it goes from the vestibular nuclei into the inferior cerebellar peduncle. The inferior cerebellar peduncle, it goes to the vestigious uh, nucleus, vestigial nucleus. Another important thing, guys, it's just the vestigial nucleus is important. It's important that it goes to the MLF. Why? Because it has to do with the eyes. It enters through the inferior, goes out through the superior. That's it. Well, lastly, we're going to talk about cerebellar syndrome. Okay. So cerebellar syndromes, they are syndromes that happen due to um, like an infarct or an ischemia or damage to whatever part of the uh, cerebellum. We're starting off with the anterior vermis syndrome. Anterior vermis syndrome usually happens because of alcohol abuse. I know. So we're going to have alcohol abuse. And because of the alcohol abuse, it's going to cause atrophy of the rostral vermis or the anterior vermis. I know. So what happens is we're going to have, it's going to mainly involve the leg and the trunk. So what's going to happen, it's going to manifest as trunk and leg ataxia. So if you think of it, remember in here when we said and no, <coughs> I'm sorry. Remember how we said and no, if it affects the spinal cerebellum, we're going to have ataxia. So in other ways, you can think and no, anterior vermis syndrome is a syndrome that's going to involve the leg region, okay? And it's going to cause trunk and leg ataxia and it's going to affect the gait. So because, you know, an ataxic gait, basically a gait that is not normal. What's gait? It's the way we move. So basically ataxic gait is a gait that's in, basically it's going to be uncoordinated, it's going to be unbalanced and so on. So uh, anterior vermis syndrome, just know, and it's related to alcohol abuse. We're going to have leg ataxia and trunk ataxia. So we're going to have clumsy movements of lower limbs. Okay. Moving on, we have posterior vermis syndrome. It will involve the follicular nodular lobe. So it involves the follicular nodular lobe. lobe. Remember how it's related to the vestibular cerebellum. So it it's going to have, uh, the eyes are not going to be normal and they're going to have imbalance. So they're going to have something called truncal ataxia. So in anterior, it's leg ataxia, okay? So what happens? We have leg ataxia. And the walk is going to be like weird. In here, we're going to have truncal ataxia in the trunk. Because remember how we said in here, and no, basically, um, here, we said in the vestigial nucleus has related to balance and movement of trunk and eyes. So if it's affected, sorry, if it's affected, okay. If the follicular nodular or the vestibular cerebellum is affected, so the vestigial nucleus is affected. So we have truncal ataxia. And the, if you can think of it, you're going to have uh, no balance, the eyes are going to be weird. Oh, heck. Something else is called hemispheric syndrome. Hemispheric syndrome will involve the... Oh, sorry. But son, I forgot to say, usually this posterior vermis. So anterior is due to alcohol abuse. Posterior vermis syndrome is due to tumors, like medulloblastoma or ependymomas. So they're usually due to tumors, okay? Hemispheric syndrome is usually, it involves the full hemisphere. So we're going to have everything, but okay? We're going to have epsilateral cerebellar signs like distal kinesia, ataxia, everything you know for, for, uh, for cerebellar signs. Okay? Um, and we're going to have arm, leg, gait, ataxia. Okay, we're going to have ataxia, obviously. We're going to have intention tremor. So you see intention tremor, he's trying to do something in here. He's trying to grab the cup, uh, the cup of water, but while grabbing it, he's having a, a, a tremor. So this is what intention tremor is. Uh, uh, what else? Yeah, and it's usually due to tumors, abscess, and farts. So really, that's up. That's everything for cerebellar syndrome. That's when at least, honestly, I don't know why the doctor included this, but we have something, so basically he's just talking, and if something damages the cerebellar hemisphere, we're going to have intention tremor, lymphataxia, loss of balance, damage to cerebellum, so epilateral deficits, and you're, he's going to fall towards the side of the legion. So if you think of it, cerebellar hemispheres are laterally, just think of everything that's affected. So we have basically lateral legion, cerebral cerebellum is gone, 
uh, part of the follicular nodular is gone and part of the vermis is gone. So the lymph, the lymph in that side is going to have basically ipsilateral deficits. We're going to have lymphataxia, loss of balance, intention tremor, all of this because we're affecting all of the hemisphere. And if we affect the vermis, we're going to have the truncal ataxia and nystagmus. Why do we have nystagmus? Because remember how basically in the middle we have the vestigius and it has to do with the eyes and it has to do with the follicular nodular because I think we're going to have movement in the eye. Okay, that's all. Thank you guys. If you have any questions, here's my email, here's my phone number and please scan the code. And yeah, that's mainly us. I know I talked a lot. I hope it was not confusing. Um, if you guys have any question, please ask me. For the cerebellar, I just did not include one slide which talks about dystokinesia and how there's agonist and antagonist tools. Um, you can guys go over it through the, you, know, you can go over it when 